Again, together we're going to look in the Word of God to discover truth. Now, for the past number of studies, we have been looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares, and then following that, we have looked at the 6th chapter of Hebrews and the 10th chapter of Hebrews, and uh, we have discovered things that we don't like a bit because it clearly uh, illustrates and indicates how successful Satan has been throughout the New Testament era as he has been assaulting the church, particularly as he has been able to seed the churches, the local congregations, with tares. People who think they are saved, people who look like they are saved, people who are in, virtually indistinguishable from the saved, and yet they are not saved. And if they happen to be in a pastor's role or an elder's role, then they're even spoken of as ministers of righteousness, even though they are emissaries of Satan. How dreadful. Well, now we're going to go back to where we departed from before we went to the parable of the wheat and tares. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 5. And as we do so, we're going to find, yes, now we have a little bit clearer understanding about all the ugly things that we're reading about in Jeremiah 5. This just didn't come along by accident that the church got into this situation where God's wrath is being declared against it, as we're reading in these opening chapters of Jeremiah. There's a reason for this. And so, as we study one part of the Bible or another part of the Bible, our total knowledge, our total perspective, if you will, of the whole situation grows and grows, and we see how it all fits together. It's all one piece. And this reassures us that we're on the path of truth, that we're not fishing for something spectacular or trying to get excited about something that will uh, be exciting to listen to, but that as we patiently look at the Bible, we find these terrible things and the wonderful things, because mixed in, there is the wonderful things. As we look at Jeremiah 5 again, and it's negative, 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 we have to keep in mind we're still in a setting of the fact that there's a great multitude which no man can number that are coming in and uh, throughout the world. And so God's salvation plan is not hindered or hampered. But God is simply explaining in the greatest detail, repeatedly, 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 why it is this terrible event of the end of the church age, this divine institution that God has built that he has designed and he has protected and he has cared for for over 1950 years and then finally it comes to an end and as it comes to an end it is a dismal situation because we see that it's practically owned by Satan even before God himself departed from the churches already Satan had been so successful that in principle he virtually owned the church anyway and so when Christ abandons the church, when he, the Holy Spirit departs from the church, it's as if he's saying, well, okay, Satan, you can have it. There's nothing here that's left that is worth keeping anyway, because the true believers have all been driven out, or they are commanded to come out. And they're only a tiny remnant of the whole, a very, very minuscule, a very tiny remnant of the whole. Well, that's about as negative as I could ever start any kind of a talk about, but that is exactly the situation that we're seeing here in Jeremiah 5. Now, we got down to verse 21 of Jeremiah 5, where God is saying, and incidentally, let's remember verse 20, this is exactly why we're going on with this teaching and keep going through the Bible. We can't skip and jump around in order to avoid negative things because uh, that's such a despairing idea and it's so negative and it makes me feel so depressed and so bad and I, I just don't want to look at it. No, we may not do that because verse 20 says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah saying here now and so on in other words it is god's command it is an integral part of god's law book that what we are talking about in connection with the end of the church age because it is derived directly from the bible is to be published 
so that anyone and everyone can hear it, including those who are within the churches. And incidentally, uh, uh, isn't it remarkable that through radio, through radio, and, and such a ministry as Family Radio, we can talk about these things without ever having to go into a local congregation. You know, when the Apostle Paul, after he had become straightened out in his theological thinking, he became a child of God. Here Before that, he was a real dyed-in-the-wool Pharisee, breathing threatenings and slaughters against these heretics who were beginning to trust in Christ and coming out of the synagogues. And he was right in there in the heart of the synagogues. But then he became straight in his thinking. He became a child of God. And, of course, out of the synagogue he is. He's, he's now a, a sent out as a missionary from the church, the local congregation in Syria, where the Holy Spirit sent out the first missionaries. We read about that in Acts 13. But now he had to go into, literally go into the synagogues and tell them, what had happened, that God was finished with the synagogues and that the days of Christ had come and that uh, that they were all wrong in the synagogues and the only right place was out there in these local congregations. And, of course, for all of his pains, normally he was threatened with being killed. In fact, he literally was beaten on several occasions. One time they stoned him and left him for dead so that he really despaired of his life. He, he prayed three times, Oh, Lord, could this thorn in this flesh of mine be removed from me? And it's these Judaizers that were after his hide because he was insisting the synagogues are finished. Oh, he didn't use that precise language. But now God was not working there anymore. The, yet the message had to get into the synagogues. We don't have to go around now and, and say, now how are we going to get this message into this congregation? You know, they have to hear this. It has to be published. How are we, or are we going to get it there? We don't have to even worry about that. Because by radio, the message is out there, out in the marketplace. And there are individuals in that congregation in any congregation who are going to be hearing about this and who are going to be disturbed about this and who are going to be going to their pastors. And so the next thing, the pastors are talking to other pastors. What about this phenomenon, this, this uh, group out here who claim that they are following the Bible and they're teaching utter rebellion against the local congregations. They're saying we're dead, that God is no longer operating. This is horrible. And so whether they like it or not, they have to deal with the question. And no one had to go to stand out in the front of the church passing out tracts to make sure that they're going to hear it. They're going to be hearing it just simply because enough people uh, hear it on radio the churches have to begin to take up that question in their larger bodies, in their classes meetings or their synodical meetings or, or the council meetings, however they meet together. They have to begin to increasingly study that question, and so the message is there. It has been published where it ought to be published. Our task is simply to faithfully declare it to the world but because of this marvelous means of internet and of radio and TV, the gospel is going to get into those churches. It's just the way it is. And bear in mind that churches are the first ones that are interested. Somebody in that church is interested in the Bible. There are still people who are nervous uh, who are interested in the Bible. And because that's the role, that's the work, that's the task of the church to present the Bible. And when here is a group of people who love, apparently love the Lord, they seem to be very faithful to the Bible, they're not coming with any wild-eyed uh, dreams and visions and so on. They're, they've had an impeccable record of many decades of faithful declaration of the Word of, of God. They've still got to listen to it, whether they like it or not. Well, now we come down to verse 22. Verse 22, and that's where we'll begin our lesson today. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have 
place the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail? Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it? Now we have two things here. The first thing is, is that God is talking about fearing and trembling. And he is talking to a congregation, all the local congregations, where God is effectively saying, you are not fearing me. Now, why is it that the Bible constantly talks about fear, fearing God? Why wouldn't it have been better if God had simply uh, designed the gospel message so that he could say, you know, I'm a loving God. I'm a, just a wonderful, loving God, and I have a salvation program, and uh, you listen to me, and uh, maybe in time some of you will become saved. What's the problem? The problem is that the key word is salvation. And salvation has to do with being saved. And when you're saved, you have to be saved from something. You're not just saved uh, because you're walking down the street and all is well. You can't say, well, while I was walking in that block, I got saved from anything at all because you weren't threatened with anything. But the human race was designed in the image of God, we were created in the image of God to love God and to properly obey God. And because God is a God of justice, a God of law, God also gave law to the human race. In fact, as we've learned, we went through this in an earlier study, even God himself is under the law of God. And there is the problem, because law requires closure. You cannot have law, legitimate law, unless there is the finality of a trial. How well did you do? Have you disobeyed? And will there be a penalty assessed if you did not obey? And until that trial has been conducted, and the penalty has been assessed if it is if the lawbreaker is found guilty the law has not had closure it has not been completed it has not done its work that's why when we read about the souls under the altar in Re revelation 6 who are now finished with their task of loving their fellow man and bringing the gospel because they are they have died or been martyred and they're with in their soul existence they're with Christ but they have one desire how long O Lord will you will it be before you bring your vengeance on the wicked of the world that was effectively what they are asking because that is the finality of the law book of God there must be that trial and the sentencing of the guilty. That has to be. Because it is a law book, and because God has decreed certain commands that we have to obey, and there is a penalty, and because that penalty is so enormously terrible, because sin is so enormously terrible, therefore, Mankind ought to be fearing and trembling before God because suppose I am guilty. Now, even to make the situation more dramatic, it is the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that God's law is written on the heart of mankind. So intuitively they know there is a God they have to answer to. Why is it that in heathen are cultures where they don't know anything about the Bible. Why is it that they are making sacrifices, even human sacrifice? Go to the archaeologists, they dig up the ruins of this ancient tribe or that ancient city, and they find the, the uh, altars where human sacrifice has been offered. Why? Why? 
because mankind knows crystal clear that he has to answer to God. And he doesn't know how bad it is, but he knows it is bad. It requires uh, some kind of uh, uh, a life in order to, to somehow appease the angry gods. And this is in the heart of man. But now God is talking to the local congregations. Now, they, if anybody ought to be fearing and trembling because they have the law book. And the law book, it talks about the uh, the results of sin, right? The very verses that we're reading in Jeremiah talk about God's wrath, God's wrath coming. And so these are the, the people who of all the people of the earth, they don't have to trust in what they intuitively feel because God's law is written on their hearts. They have it in written language. And so they, if anybody, ought to fear and tremble before God. How are we doing? Are we truly saved? Are we truly secure in Christ? There ought to be a, an enormous, enormous fear in their hearts. In fact, it is, it is so much a part of what God expects to see in mankind, that even after we're saved, we are told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Why, even after we're saved, shouldn't then we come to the security of knowing that uh, we're secure in Christ? And, and so why should we fear and tremble? You can find that passage in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And it's there. It's there. And it reiterates what we find elsewhere in the Bible. It's not something that's just oddly placed there. We read in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, one of the key verses that address this matter of fear and trembling, we're going to talk about fear and trembling for just a moment in connection with the true believer. Why should we fear? And, and once we get through with that, we'll back up and, and look at it. Well, then what about those who are not true believers? If the true believer should be living, fearing, and trembling, then where does that place someone who's never become saved or who just thinks that he is, and yet his walk clearly indicates he's not saved? But when we go to 1 John chapter 4, that is the verse that opens up this question better than any in the Bible. In 1 John chapter 4, we read about love. The whole chapter has to do with love. We read in verse 10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And then, before we go any further, we immediately have to define love, and we have to do this every time so we get it very clear, because love can be very ephemeral, very ethereal. What do you mean love? What does it mean to love? I love beans for dinner. I love steak. I love uh, this jewelry. I love, uh, you know, we use the word love as promiscuously as we use any word. But God has a very de clear definition of love, and that's found in John, amongst other places, it's found in John 14. In John 14, verse 21, verse 23, and verse 24, three times God gives this definition. Verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. John 14, verse 21. John 14, verse 21. Again, verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words. God is clearly developing the principle that love is expressed by obedience, by obedience. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to 1 John chapter 4. It says uh, uh, in verse 16, uh, 1 John 4, And we have known and believed the, the love that God hath to us, and incidentally, in Christ's love, for the Father, and God, Christ's love for those whom he came to save, what was required on his behalf? 
perfect obedience. Had he not been perfectly obedient, would there have been perfect love? The answer is no. And had there not been perfect love, the whole message of the gospel would have gone into ruin because it required the perfect obedience, the perfect love of Christ, as he obeyed the law of God to carry it out. But now we get in to verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. But we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, if we stopped right there, if we stopped right with that verse, we might conclude, Oh, I see, I see. This verse is set up so that it is encouraging us that we can move toward perfection in this world. That's the subject here, perfect love. We can move toward perfection. If we try hard enough, we can become perfect. And then God tells us that if our love is perfect, look at verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And God here, incidentally, is defining fear. So we have no misunderstanding about this, because fear hath torment. And so the fear God is talking about when he says we have to fear God is the fear of the wrath of God, the torment that comes because of our sins. But here, apparently, God is saying that we can move toward perfect love, and then we will not have any fear any longer, because it says here, but perfect love casteth out fear. The problem is that when we read these verses in the light of the whole Bible, we find that we cannot arrive at perfect love. It's an impossibility. Why? Because we have not had experienced a resurrected body as yet. We have to live in our brand new resurrected soul in which we have an intense desire for perfect love. We have an intense desire to be obedient to God's commandments. In fact, it is so intense that 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 says, That which is born of God cannot sin. And if we could only live in this world with a perfect body then we could live in perfect love, then we would have no fear, then Philippians 2 verse 12 could not apply, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because that can't be. Perfect love casteth out fear. And so we do not have perfect love, and therefore we still fear and tremble before God. Oh my, I think this as far as we can go in this study. Our time has run out. Lord willing, we'll be together again in our next family Bible study.